The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. Thank you for joining us in our Webinar Wednesday series as we cover the DFARS. Uh, and today we are kind of wrapping up our second to last webinar in in the series. So it is a complimentary series. Uh, we started um, in January and went chronologically through each of the DFARS. Uh, in 2020, we actually covered all of the FAR regulations and went chronologically through those as well. All of the recordings and the PowerPoints are on our website. Uh, you can find those uh, under both the FAR and the DFARS tabs. Um, we'll have today's recording uh, probably later this afternoon or early evening up on our website and also on our YouTube channel. Again, those are all complimentary and easily accessed. Uh, our speakers are subject matter experts in defense contracting, including uh, attorneys, consultants, uh, accountants at time, and other professionals. A uh, quick blurb here about us. We are a uh, downtown Washington, D.C.-based firm providing uh, consulting services for federal contractors. Uh, we work with product companies, service companies, software firms, and help them understand the market. Uh, so pipeline reports, uh, we help with GSA schedules, proposal writing, uh, contract compliance and administration. If you want to find more about our services, you can go to our website and go to the About Us section. Okay, uh, before we dig into today's topic, we want to thank our sponsors who make these webinars possible. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our friends over at the Virginia PTAC, which is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They are the uh, statewide headquarters for the state of Virginia and co-located with George Mason University in Fairfax. Uh, they offer training, counseling, mentoring, uh, and I believe they have uh, shifted lately, I think, to some in-person events. Um, don't quote me on that. Go to their website to take a look, and uh, you've got some contact names or at least contact uh, email and phone number there uh, on the screen. Next up is uh, C3 Integrated Solutions. Uh, they provide CMMC uh, services, uh, DFARS and NIST 800-171 compliance. Your contact there is going to be the info at c3isit.com, and you've got a phone number there in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, also, we want to thank WorkPlan. Uh, like C3, WorkPlan is also a newsletter advertiser for us. Uh, they are a software platform for government contractors providing project management, DCAA compliant accounting, and contract management uh, software tools for contractors. Your contact is Anita, and her uh, details are found in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. The Federal Business Council, most people are probably familiar with these guys. I've put on the awesome uh, procurement fair. Uh, I think it's been going on almost 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they've got a lot of virtual and in-person events with government and government contractors. Uh, David Powell is your contact, and his information is in the lower center of your screen. Gov White Papers has sprung out of Gov Events, and this is a online platform to post and download uh, content related to government and government contracting. Uh, Donna Monday is your contact, and her email is there at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Thanks to Gov White Papers for their um, sponsorship here. Slick Tech, uh, these folks are a provider of CMMC um, certification. Um, they were early adopters, and they're also a registered provider organization and have two of their own uh, registered practitioners uh, designated by the CMMC accreditation body. Eric Clark is your contact. He's in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you've got contact email and phone number there for Eric. Uh, next up, we've got Ocean 5 Strategies. Uh, your point of contact is Chris Brinker. Her information is in your lower right-hand uh, corner of your screen. They are your go-to if you're a government contractor, if you need help with your website, search engine optimization, any sort of uh, marketing services. These guys are really great to work with. They're good people and, um, and fun, and, uh, and they're good at what they do. So, um, again, we want to thank Ocean 5 uh, Strategies for their sponsorship. Okay, now the reason why we're here, uh, we've got Michelle Ledekin with us from uh, Morris Manning and Martin. Uh, she's put together a great presentation today on the DFARS. And so we're going to go here to the DFARS Part 252 clauses. And Michelle, I'm going to stop speaking, I'm going to mute myself and turn the floor over to you. So thanks for joining us today. 
Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, and good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Good morning still if you're on the West Coast. Uh, today we're going to be covering DFARS 252. We can go to the next slide. If you've looked at, you know, pulled up 252 online or you have a hard copy of the DFAR, you probably know that this is a big section of the DFARS. It's got more than 100 clauses. It would be impossible for us to cover all of the clauses that are within to part 252 today. So we're going to focus on the most common and the most generally applicable. There are relatively few DFARS provisions that are mandatory for all contracts. Most are limited to certain types of contract work, be it construction or services or major systems acquisitions. And then they can also depend on the type of contract you have, be it a fixed price, cost reimbursement, commercial items, that type of thing. Uh, and as you know from, if you've reached this final or penultimate, I guess, DFARS presentation, uh, of the year with Jennifer, the DFARS are in addition to FAR provisions. So there may be some overlap that you see between these provisions and, and FAR provisions that are in your contract. So the way that I've thought about what clauses to cover today is to group them into these different categories, which the first um, item is commercial item contracts, mandatory flow downs. If you're a subcontractor or a prime contractor, those are um, provisions that you regularly see, I would suspect. And then our next category will be cybersecurity. After that, we'll talk about supply chain and then subcontracting, ethics and employment, and ended up with intellectual property. Uh, so we can go on to next. The first group, as I said, that we're going to cover is the commercial item contract mandatory flowdowns. What, what it means to be a mandatory flow down is if any of these provisions are in the prime contract, they must be included in any subcontract issued under the prime contract. These clauses are found in commercial item contracts. A commercial item is defined in FAR 2.101, and it generally means any item that is a type customarily used by the general public or it only has minor modifications to be used by the government so a lot of products and services that the government buys are considered commercial items everything from it services to landscaping to furniture uh, lots and lots of things are commercial items even things you wouldn't think are commercial items like debt collection services that I can tell you um, is, a, is considered to be a commercial item by the government. And depending on the scope of work you have, there may be other provisions that are mandatory flow downs and the, the clause will say it if it's a mandatory, if it needs to be flowed down. And we'll see some of those clauses as we move through these various provisions today. So we'll move on to the next slide where we'll talk about the first mandatory flow down. And this is the requirement to inform employees of whistleblower rights. This is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if this clause is in your contract, you need to inform your employees in writing of the whistleblower rights and protections that are available under law. That can be done through your handbook, through posters in the office. You know, you have a lot of options here. It just needs to be done in writing. And as you'll see in part B here, it specifically says this needs to be included in all subcontracts. Next slide, please. And then we have the 252-204-7015, Notice of Authorized Disclosure of Information for Litigation Support. This provision gives you a heads up that information you have provided to the government in your proposal or in contract, you know, during performance may be shared with other contractors, litigation support contractors, for the sole purpose of litigation support. So it's just giving you a heads up about that fact. And then again, it needs to be flowed down to subcontractors. Next. And now we have export controlled items. Particularly when you're working with the Department of Defense, there's you know a high probability that you're gonna be working with sensitive information that the government does not want to be exported 
unless the government, you know, has knowledge of it and approves of it. And so this provision is meant to accomplish that goal by requiring you as a contractor to comply with all applicable laws and regulations regarding export control. I mean, I'll say this can come up in even situations where you're not thinking about it. I've worked on protests and you know litigation that involved export controlled items. And we had to be careful when we used vendors to print up, you know, large posters to use in hearings because we couldn't have non US citizens handling the information. Uh, so that, you know, you might not think about it in that context, but it can come up. And again, you know, party, you need to flow this down to all subcontracts. So I'll note here that whenever a FAR provision specifically says that it needs to be flowed down, that can be a helpful point when you're negotiating with your subcontractors, because if they push back and say, we don't want all these provisions in here, we don't generally do work with the government. If it's required to be flowed down, it needs to be flowed down. And you can say, hey, you can't blame me, subcontractor, talk to the government, this is required. Next, please. And here we have our first intellectual property slash data rights related provision of the day. And I'll say, you know, there are entire webinars and books um, dedicated to intellectual property and data rights. So we can't get into all the nitty gritty here today, but I wanna point out some of the most relevant and you know, applicable provisions that are in the DFARS. And this is one that you may see pretty frequently because it does apply to commercial items. And under this clause, the government gets an unrestricted right to use, modify, reproduce, display, et cetera, the technical data that you as a contractor provide. But it's important to know that this provision specifically states when the information is provided without restriction. So one of the things that we always recommend contractors be mindful of is if you wanna preserve your intellectual property, one of the most important things to do that is when you provide it to the government or any third party to mark it with the restrictions because that really limits what the government can do with it. So if you see here in B1 little i, it says have been provided to the government or others without restrictions on use. So as soon as you start imposing restrictions that can limit what the government's able to do and kind of cabin in this unrestricted right that they speak to in the, the very beginning of the, the clause. Next slide, please. And then relatedly, we have 227, uh, 7037, which is the validation of restrictive markings on technical data. And this provides that there is a presumption that the technical data was developed exclusively at private expense, meaning your, your contractor expense for commercial items. That's beneficial to contractors because the way that the IP rules within the government work is the government looks to who paid for the intellectual property to determine who owns it. So if something is developed 100% at private expense, the government has the least amount of rights available to it. And we'll talk about this later, when you have mixed government funding, the government gets a little more rights. When it's totally government funded, then the government gets maximum rights. So there is a presumption when you're dealing with commercial items, because as I said, those are things you know you could buy a, that anyone could buy that it's not funded by the government and therefore the contractor maintains their rights. The clause also has a provision for justifying when the government believes that it needs, that it has greater rights and a process for resolving any disputes that come up under this provision. And I'll note that it's important when you have government contracts to track when things are developed to try to, if it, things are being developed outside of a government contract to maintain records to show that. So if you get in a situation where the government claims that it has greater rights than you think they should, you're able to come forward and say, well, no, we developed this for this purpose. This is the money we use. This is who was involved. Those people weren't on the government contract. And that helps you as a contractor preserve your intellectual property rights. Next, please. And then uh, this is the provision that establishes that the clauses we were just talking about need to be flowed down to your, to your subcontracts. You can see that it says you're not required to flow down any DFARs 
unless it's specified. And then while not required, you can choose to flow down subcontracts for commercial items, you know, minimal additional clauses to satisfy your obligations. And then again, you need to include this actual clause in your subcontracts because your first tier subcontractors should be flowing down mandatory flow downs to their subcontractors. Next. Okay, we've already finished the first topic and now we are moving on to cybersecurity. You've probably seen a lot more attention to this area. You know, I saw some of the sponsors that Jennifer talked about have expertise in CMMC. That's one of the cybersecurity initiatives that came out last year and is currently being revamped. So this is, I would say, an evergreen issue at this point. I think we've all probably gotten an email notifying us that our information was hacked and the government is very concerned about that. And so you will see these provisions in a lot of your contracts and subcontracts. So let's talk about them. Next, please. Before there is, uh, was the DOD assessment in CMMC, which came out last year, the DFARS contained 252-204-7008. Um, and many con and this requires you to comply, certify your compliance with what are called the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology standards that are in the special publication 800171. These include things like multi-factor authentication and passwords and segregating information and tracking access. A lot of contractors who had 252, 204, 7008, and then we'll talk about 7012, and their contracts just kind of checked the box and didn't really pay attention to it. Um, the DOD assessment is a way to kind of bring some more teeth into this requirement. But when you see 252, 204, 7008 in your contract, you are complying, you are certifying that you are complying with these NIST requirements. Next, please. And then here we have 7012, which is the related clause. And under this clause, you are you're required to provide adequate security on all contractor info systems. So that raises the question, what is adequate security? Well, according to the FAR, adequate security means protective measures that are commensurate with the consequences and probability of loss, misuse, or unauthorized access to or modification of information. So that means it's kind of a moving standard. Depending on what type of information you're dealing with, the government could think you need to have more measures in place in order to provide adequate security. And it also raises the question of, well, what are covered contractor information systems? Well, that is an unclassified information system that is owned or operated by or for a contractor and that processes, stores, or transmits covered defense information. So the computer that you're sitting in front of right now, you know, watching this webinar, if you do any work for the government, involving that computer, that would be a covered contractor information, information information system. And then we have the question of, well, what is it? And then it says for covered contractor information systems that are not part of an IT service or operation, the government therefore is not subject to the security requirements specified. And so that gives you a little bit of an opening that they're not subject to these specific requirements, but you need to follow these additional requirements. And I think it's important to recognize that this provision is intended to address your co contractor information systems that handle covered defense information. And there's a lot of questions about what constitutes covered defense information because it's got a rather broad definition. The DFAR says this means unclassified controlled technical information or other information as described in the controlled unclassified information registry, gives you a website, that requires safeguarding or dissemination controls pursuant to and consistent with laws and regulations. And there's been a lot of, you know, people have gone to their contracting officers and asked them to specifically identify, you know, what is the covered defense information under this contract? We wanna be mindful of you know, these policies and protect it. 
but we've seen a lot of contracting officers are hesitant to provide that kind of information, which leaves you know contractors with a lot of uncertainty about what information they need to apply these measures to. And the next slide, please, includes cyber incident reporting requirements that are also under uh, DFARS 252-204-7012. And these are pretty extensive um, that when, so if you, if you encounter a cyber incident, one of the first things you should do is pull up 204 7012 and make sure that you walk through the protocols that are in there because there are timelines with when you were supposed to report the incident to the government and specific places where it needs to be reported to and then updates that need to be provided. So if you are, as I said, if you're a victim you know, or you, of one of these cyber incidents. There's a lot of things I understand that you have on your mind at that point, but one of the things to make, you need to make sure you do is look at this provision and make sure that you follow the steps that are in here. And then again, this is a flow down. It, it needs to be included if a subcontractor's performance is going to involve that covered defense information. So this is one of the places where it can get tricky because if the CO won't tell you whether your contract involves covered defense information or what is covered defense information, then it's hard for you to know whether to flow it down to a subcontractor. But you know, I would say if I was in your shoes, if there was any probability that the subcontractor would be handling covered defense information, I would make sure that I flowed this provision down. Next slide, please. And so here we have the DOD assessment that I briefly mentioned earlier. This clause was introduced last year, so you may have started seeing it being incorporated into contracts now. And it sets up a system that uses that same NIST publication. And depending on the level of assessment required, the contractor either does a self-assessment for a basic level assessment or a the government comes in and does an assessment if it's a medium or high assessment and the level of assessment is set determining on the kind of information that the contract deals with and the FAR provision has a whole uh, explanation for what you need to do to self-report your basic assessment next slide please and this continues the same provision to again note that you need to flow this provision down uh, into subcontracts and then you can you want your subcontractors to tell you if they have submitted their information to S to SPRS which is the place where you submit this within the last three years um, because otherwise you should not be awarding them the subcontract next slide please okay and here is the current version of the CMMC provision as you may have heard, the government has recently changed, announced that we'll be changing CMMC from a five level system to a three level system and requiring fewer outside accreditations. And so I suspect this provision will be changed in the near future. And this provision has also just been slowly being rolled out over the last, over the next several years with a planned implementation for 2025. So this may not be something you've seen Although we have seen prime contractors trying to flow it down to subcontractors, even if it's not in the prime contract. So, you know, if you're in that situation, you may have seen it from a prime contractor. And so if you, if you have this provision in your prime contract, you're gonna have to follow the CMMC certification that currently exists. Um, and if a prime contractor is trying to push it down to you because it is a required flow down, uh, you know, you should verify that it is actually in the prime contract before going through all the uh, steps that are needed to comply with it at this time. Next slide, please. Okay, next topic is going to be supply chain and sourcing. So this is a combination of, of two issues that get addressed here. One is security concerns. We'll see with the prohibition on the acquisition of covered defense telecommunications equipment. And then there's also, a, you know, a policy of favoring American suppliers and then secondarily uh, suppliers that we have trade agreements with. And this, you know, we've seen this as a bipartisan issue. 
Uh, so this is not going to go anywhere. You know, these provisions keep getting updated and, and modified, but they're not, I would not expect them to be rescinded. So I think we can assume they're going to be in the DFARS going forward. So let's start out on the next slide with the prohibition on the acquisition of covered defense telecommunications equipment. A lot of words there, um, but it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's, it's uh, according to the NDAA, you cannot provide the government with any equipment systems or services you, for covered missions that use covered defense telecommunications or equipment or services as a substantial component. And so let's unpack what those definitions mean. Covered defense telecommunications equipment or services means potentially telecommunications equipment produced by Huawei or ZTE or any subsidiary or affiliate of such entities. Those are Chinese entities. So if you're seeing, you know, supplies telecommunication equipment coming from Chinese suppliers, that should be a big red flag that, you know, the government is not going to want you to use those or provide those to the government. Because um, the second part of this definition is telecommunication services provided by such entities or using such equipment. And the third part of covered defense telecommunications equipment or services is uh, those services or equipment that are produced by an entity that the Secretary of Defense reasonably believes to be an entity owner controlled or otherwise connected to the government of a foreign country. And the concern here is that, you know, the foreign governments could be using the telecommunications equipment to intercept or interfere with the government's operations. And then the next definition we need to focus on is covered mission. That means either the nuclear deterrence mission of DOD, including with respect to nuclear command control and communications, integrated tactical warning and attack assessment and continuity of government, or the homeland defense mission of DOD, including with respect to ballistic missile defense. And I would just say, I would never assume that a contract is not a covered mission unless the CO tells you that, because the DOD tends to have a pretty broad interpretation of what it means to like, protect the warfighter and protect the homeland. And, you know, I think there are probably a lot of contracts out that are they're very clearly related to covered defense missions and some that may be more ambiguous. So it's always best to get that confirmation from the contracting officer. So if you're providing those kinds of services, you need to make, be very careful that you're not using any of this prohibited equipment. Again, it needs to be flowed down, including for commercial item subcontracts. And then I'll point out that 252, 204, 7016, and 7017 provide for representations that are related to this prohibition where you need to, you know, specifically state in, that you're not providing these prohibited services or equipment. Okay, next, please. Okay, our first Buy American provision. This clause implements Buy American, which is a statute that you may have all heard of. And if this clause is in your contract, it means that you are only allowed to deliver a domestic end products, which is basically is an unmanufactured, it can be an unmanufactured end product that's been mined or produced in the United States, or there can be a, a kind of complex definition that comes into play for things that are manufactured in the US because if, if more than 50% of the components are from the US, well, then that's gonna be a domestic end product. Um, but then you can get, I won't, again, this is one of those topics where you could have a whole webinar to, dedicated to the Buy America Act. Um, if something's made in America, it's a domestic end product. If it's partially made in America, then you need to start getting into the details of where things are coming from and whether they're essential and whether they're commercial off the shelf items. Um, so I don't want to dwell too much in those details. Or the other option here in the DFARS is that you can certify that the item is coming from a qualifying country. And for this clause, a qualifying country means a country with a reciprocal defense procurement memorandum of understanding or another agreement with the United States. And that includes um, 
a lot of the, you know, the kind of NATO or friendly countries that you would think of, like Australia, Austria, Canada, Czech Republic. It also includes um, places like Egypt, Estonia, Israel, Latvia. Turkey is a qualifying country. And so if you're ever dealing with a, an overseas supplier, it's good to check the clause and see if they are coming from, they're one of these qualifying countries. And then again, um, 252, 225, 7,000 has a certification related to this particular clause. Next slide, please. This is a similar provision. Instead of the Buy American, it is for trade agreements. So it, it's a little bit broader in that you are uh, allowing your offer to specify where things are coming from. And you have an option if, if designated countries are um, insufficient, you can notify the government and get a national interest waiver. And here, a designated country, qualifying country has the same meaning. It's a little bit broader because we also have designated country end products, which is not included in our prior slide. And a designated country means several different things. It can include a World Trade Organization, government procurement agreement country. Um, and there's a long list of countries there like Armenia, and some of these are duplicative of the other categories in the qualifying country, but we've got Armenia, you know, we've got Hong Kong, Iceland, Liechtenstein, New Zealand, Poland, Slovenia, Spain, lots of countries here. And we also have free trade agreement country counts as a designated country, which includes Australia, Bahrain, Canada, Chile, Colombia. So these are all countries that we have free trade agreements with. We also count a least developed country. And these are some of, you know, the more, you know, the old term would be third world, but you know, a developing country like Afghanistan, Benin, Bhutan, Cambodia, Nepal, long list here as well. And then a Caribbean basin country, which as you might suspect includes Caribbean countries like uh, Aruba and Bahamas. And so again, you know, if you have a contract with this provision in it and you're looking at getting things from overseas, you wanna check the clause and make sure that the supplier you're planning on using is from what, a country that is either a qualifying country or a designated country. Next. Similar provision here, except now we get even a little bit broader because this provision and adds, as you see, it continues free trade agreement end products other than Bahrainian end products, Moroccan end products, Panamanian end products, Peruvian end products, or other foreign products. So this provision defines what it means to be a Moroccan end product, a Panamanian end product. So again, if this provision is in your contract, you want to check and make sure the supplies you are plant, the good supplies you are providing are going to be compliant. Next. Our next topic is subcontracting, and these are provisions that you should be mindful of when you award some contracts. So this isn't just about, this is not the flow down issue that we were talking about earlier, but these are provisions that affect your relationship with subcontractors and your selection of subcontractors. Next. So here we have 252-209-7004. This is pretty self-explanatory. Um, basically, you should not enter into a subcontract with a company that is owned or controlled by a government of a country that is a state sponsor of terrorism. I, I can't imagine this comes up all that much, but I want you to be aware of it. Um, and you know, it's, it could be very problematic if you violated this provision. So. You want to make sure that you are not awarding a contract to one of these types of entities. And it can be helpful just to include, I know sometimes companies can try to hide their ownership, things happen. You can always include a representation in your subcontract, you know, saying that, you know, we represent, we are not a firm that is owned or controlled by a government or a country, a country that is a state sponsor of terrorism. And that'll help you cover your basis with this one. Next. And this is the DFARS perversion 
a special version of the small business subcontracting plan because this is a test program. You know, you're probably familiar with the FAR provision that requires subcontracting plans for other than small businesses. This is an additional provision in the DFARS that has a test program that requires semi-annual reports. It includes liquidated damages for the prime contractor if they fail to make a good, good faith effort to comply. So that adds some teeth to the requirement that the primes find good small businesses to work with and to be eligible to participate in this program the prime must be under at least three DOD contracts during the preceding fiscal year that have an aggregate value of at least $100 million. So it's pretty big prime contractors that would be eligible to participate in this program. Next. Now, if you are a small business, this provision would be particularly relevant to you. It is accelerating payments to small business subcontractors, prohibition on fees and considerations. Under this clause, the prime contractor needs to pay you quickly and they are not required to, they are not permitted to charge any fees when making these accelerated payments. And then again, this is supposed to be included in any uh, subcontracts, including commercial item subcontracts. And I'll note that accelerated payment, which is used in this clause, is defined as payment made to small business subcontractors with, as quickly as possible with a goal of 15 days or less after receipt of payment from the government or receipt of proper invoice from subcontractor, whichever is later. So if you keep this provision in mind and you're a small business, you could use this when you're trying to negotiate with your prime contractors, you know, to not accept 30 day payment, but say, hey, you know, according to the DFARS, you're supposed to pay me as quickly as possible, ideally 15 days. So let's use that in our subcontract. Next, please. Moving right along to our next section, which is ethics and employment. And these are the things, you know, the government looks for in a contractor to know that you're being a good citizen and complying with you know, the spirit of a lot of these government regulations that apply to government contractors. Next slide, please. So we'll start off with 252, 203, 7,000. It's a pretty straightforward provision. You are not allowed to knowingly provide compensation to a covered DOD official within two years after the official leaves DOD service without first determining the official has sought and received uh, you know, it's called as an ethics opinion regarding what they're allowed, what this individual is allowed to do once they leave the government. I'll know, and you may be wondering what is a covered DOD official? That is someone who leaves or left DOD service on or after January 28th, 2008, and participated personally and substantially in an acquisition with a value of excess of 10 million and serves or served in an executive schedule position, a position in the senior executive service, or a general or flag officer position. And it also includes a DOD official that served in program manager, deputy program manager, procuring contracting officer, administrative contracting officer, source selection authority, member of a source selection evaluation board, or a chief of a financial or technical evaluation team in a contract that was in excess of 10 million. So what this basically means is if you're looking at hiring someone who had you know, a relatively high up position within the DOD or was very involved with procurement, you wanna make sure that you get an ethics opinion before you do that, saying that it's okay for them to take the position that you have offered, because otherwise you could end up in problems I've seen the government investigate contractors in these situations and you also see people raise it in protest claiming that you know the conflict of interest or some kind of procurity procurement integrity act violation or some other conflict of interest that the contractor was able to get you know special access or information because they have employed a former DOD official next okay now we have 252 203 7001 which prohibits you from 
hiring a person who's convicted of fraud or other defense contract related felonies. And, you know, if you read this closely, you may not notice that it, it specifically addressed that fraud or a felony arising out of a contract with the DOD. So if you interviewed someone and they were convicted of fraud, but it was completely unrelated to a DOD contract, this provision does not apply. I mean, you may not want to hire that person for other reasons, but this provision would not prevent you from doing it. This provision is specifically directed at fraud coming out of a DOD contract. Um, and then you agree again to flow this provision down to first tier subcontracts, except for commercial items or components. So, you know, if you were buying pencils or computers, you know, something off the shelf like that, you would not need to flow this provision down. Next. Okay. Straightforward provision here, the 252-203-7004, display of hotline posters. You are required, if this provision is in your contract, and it is in most DOD contracts, to display the DOD fraud, waste, and abuse hotline poster prominently in common work areas. So that's often, you know, in the copy room, in the break room, anywhere where, you know, most of your employees are, are visiting on a day-to-day -day -day basis. And then there's an additional requirement if the contract is getting funding for the Department of Homeland Security to also include the Department of Homeland Security fraud poster. And then again, you need to flow this down to your subcontracts, except for uh, commercial items subcontracts. Next, we have 252-203-7005. This is the representation that goes along with the provision we just talked about a couple of slides ago, dealing with compensating former DOD officials. So when you submit your offer, you're representing that you have not provided such prohibited compensation to a DOD official. Pretty straightforward. Next slide. Anti-terrorism training. So if you have this provision in your contract, it's, it requires you to provide special training to your employees if they're going to be accessing military, military bases, facilities, et cetera. The government usually works with you to, you know, tell you what kind of training needs to be provided and any subcontracts that are going to have similar access to federally controlled facility or military installations would also need to have this kind of training. Next. Drug free workforce, you need to have a policy to try to have a drug free workforce and I'll note that. This is a federal drug free, so it, it relies on the federal definitions of what's legal and illegal. So under this clause, even if cannabis or marijuana is legal in your state, it's still illegal at the federal level. Your program is supposed to have you know, alternatives with like assistance programs, training, and testing for employees that are in sensitive positions. And an employee in a sensitive position is an employee who has been granted access to classified information or employees, you know, similar positions with national security type of implications. You can have testing measures for those types of employees. Next. And then we have 252-222-7006, restrictions on the use of mandatory arbitration agreements. You and your subcontractors are not allowed to have agreements with your employees that require arbitration for claims under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So those are things like age, sex, and race discrimination, national origin discrimination, or torts related to a arising out of sexual harassment or assault, battery, intentional infliction, emotional distress. Those types of claims are often brought with um, employment discrimination claims. So the, the gist there is that those would have to be litigated in court. You can't have an agreement that requires those employees to bring those types of claims through arbitration. Next. And now we're in our final topic, which is intellectual property. And again, I want to stress that there are entire books and webinars, I bet Jennifer has hosted one, um, focused just on intellectual property or data rights and government contracts. So we're only going to dip our toes in the water here. 
but these are provisions that you should be aware of um, and mindful of when when you are negotiating contracts with the government and with prime contractors. Next. So start out with a simple one, 252, 227, 7010 provides that you are agreeing to grant a separate license to other government agencies. So if you have a contract with the Air Force, you are agreeing that the Marine Corps also gets a license for the patents, applications for patents and improvements here. Next. Assignments, this is standard language that um, the, the DFARS gives for contracting officers to use when negotiating an assignment under a, a DOD contract. And an assignment means that you are you're giving your right in the patent to the government. And this is a sample language that the government would use to accomplish that goal. Next. Okay, and here we have rights and technical data, non-commercial items. So this is kind of the other side of the coin of the commercial items provision that we looked at earlier. And this is a long provision, um, so I only have part of it here. But the essence of it is that you, under this contract, are agreeing to give the government a royalty-free worldwide non-exclusive license. Uh, and it, there's different types of rights that are contemplated within this clause and they depend on the type of funding. So government purpose rights means the right, the government gets the right to use, modify, reproduce, release, perform, et cetera, technical data within the government. So just within the government without restriction. And those rights accrue if there's mixed funding. So if some of the funding comes from the government and some comes from the contractor, you get government purpose rights. Limited rights means the government gets the right to use, modify, reproduce, or disclose within the government. So it's a little, it's a little bit broader than government purpose rights. And that occurs if, the, if it's 100% private funding. So if the contractor provides the funding. And unlimited rights means the government has the right to use, modify, reproduce, perform, display, et cetera, in any manner and for any purpose and to anyone. So that's why it's very broad. You know, we have government purpose rights that are limited to the government. Um, and this is the, the way other side of that where they can use it anywhere. And that occurs when the government has provided all of the funding. And then you also have this option for specially negotiated license rights. And that you know is an option to you if the government is willing to cooperate to negotiate uh, the terms, and that would cover you know how the, the intellectual property can be used and how long. And so that is you know always something to raise with the government if you want to try to maximize your rights under the contract. Next, and then we have rights in bidder proposal information. This is giving you a heads up that when you turn in your solicitate your proposal and responding to the solicitation, if you have not marked your proposal pretty carefully, the government is going to obtain the rights to that. And so that's why it's always important to mark up your proposal and indicate what you believe is your property, because um, that can help prevent you, protect your rights going forward. And then you also want your subcontractors to mark their information and you need to include this cost, you know, to convey that to the subcontractors to let them know. And then our next and final substantive slide here will be next. And this is the government rights unlimited. And this is, you know, something if you, most companies are very protective of their IP rights. So if you see this in your, in a solicitation, you know, it may give you pause. You may want to take a step back and think about what you can do uh, to preserve your rights. Because when this clause is there, the government gets an unlimited right in all drawings, designs, specifications, notes, other works, et cetera, developed in the performance of the contract. And so basically that's saying, you know, anything that you generate in performance of the contract, the government is going to obtain an unlimited right over. And so, you know, if that is a concern to you, you'll have that, you know, opportunity to try to raise that with the CO and negotiate it. Okay, that is the last substantive slide I have here.
as I said, there's, you know, a lot to get through in the DFARS. I hope that this was beneficial to you and gives you kind of a sense of the big kind of categories of information that the DFAR covers and things that you should be mindful of as a prime contractor and a subcontractor. Thank you. Michelle, this was awesome. Thank you so much for the great content, um, putting together the, uh, the slides and sharing your, your knowledge and insight on the DFARS with us. If anyone has any questions about the DFARS, uh, I cannot help you, but Michelle can. So please contact her directly. You've got her email address and her phone number listed here on the screen. Uh, the PowerPoint slides, I believe, are already up on slideshare.net. Uh, and we'll have the YouTube video uh, posted um, usually within 24 hours, but it should be up later this afternoon or early evening. Again, thanks to the audience for joining us today and making time. And thanks again to Michelle for preparing um, just uh, awesome and excellent slides. And you made it very easy to understand, even for somebody like me. So really appreciate that. Well, and thank you, Jennifer, for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Great, thank you. And uh, next Wednesday will be our final DFARS part. Uh, same time, same place. So 12 o'clock next Wednesday. And we hope uh, everyone will join us then. Thanks again, everyone.